The vision of God thrown home that John received in Revelation chapter 4 is a very important vision. It is one that provides inspiration and motivation for God's people during times of crisis. It reminds us that God is in charge of the affairs of humanity. In this video, I will not only share the significance of this vision, I will also interpret the symbols that are presented in it. Hello and welcome to this series on the book of Revelation. I'm taking you step by step through this book. In, a, in two or three previous videos, I introduced you to the book and I also covered the vision of the seven churches in two separate videos. And now I'm starting the second vision, which I'm planning to do at least four videos on this vision of the seals. The first one is about the throne of God. Just before I do that though, I want to give you some tips as I'll be doing in these videos about Revelation. Some tips on how to interpret the book of Revelation. First of all, I want to remind you that the book of Revelation contains visions that cover the history of God's people from the time of the prophet until the end. Secondly, the book does not necessarily progress chronologically from chapter 1 through to 22. What you have is a recapitulation of about seven major visions. So you're not expecting to go from chapter 1 and reading from first century, then chapter 2 brings it to the end necessarily. There's a, there's a slight progression in time in terms of um, sequence, and I'll tell you more about that in a, in a little while. The third thing I want you to keep in mind is that the book of Revelation has several divisions or can be divided in several different ways. There are two major divisions that I want to point out right now. Number one is what Jesus referred to in chapter one as things that are present and things to come or things that are present to John's time and things to come in the future. So you have chapters one and one to three cover the present things, even though they have eschatological application or future application, but they primarily refer to things present. And then the things to come start from chapter four. And the other division I want to mention is what I refer to as a sanctuary division. You're going to find that as you read the book of Revelation, there are several sanctuary scenes that we must pay attention to. And these sanctuary scenes actually open the different major visions of the book of Revelation. For example, the first vision, the vision of the seven churches, is open with the candlestick vision. That's a sanctuary vision. Jesus walking amid the seven golden candlestick. The second vision, that of the seals, is opened with the vision of the throne room and the Lamb of God being presented to the people. The third division is that of the trumpets, and that vision is opened with the, the altar of incense in Revelation chapter 8, where the angel stands at the altar of incense, and then he collects the prayers of the saints that signals the beginning of the blowing of the seven trumpets. The other division opens with the Ark of the Covenant. In Revelation chapter 11, the Ark of the Covenant vision opens up the last day events of the book of Revelation on this earth from chapter 12 through to chapter 18. That's a complete vision that was opened up by the Ark of the Covenant, and rightly so, because the Ark of the Covenant represents the, f the final events of the Jewish calendar year. The next time that the sanctuary is opened in heaven, no intercession is going on. That's in chapter 15. It is filled with smoke from the glory of God. And it opens up the vision of the fall of Babylon, that, that apostate system from chapter 16 through to 18. The next time heaven is open, we see the rider on the white horse coming, which signals the coming of Christ and the eventually the millennium. Then the next time that the sanctuary is open, there is no need for a sanctuary because God will dwell among his people and he'll be the sanctuary, so to speak. Now the throne room vision that we are talking about opens up two things. First, it opens up the things to come that John was promised. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, John was told by a voice that came from heaven, come up here and I will show you things to come. So when John went up into heaven, this throne room vision is the first thing that he saw. And as I mentioned earlier, the throne room vision also helps to open up 
the vision of the seven seals. But for the sake of understanding the book of Revelation, I try not to clunk it with the vision of the seals. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to do at least four different presentations on the seals to really get a clear understanding of it. You know, one of the things I'm trying to avoid is that when I was growing up in the church and heard sermons on the book of Revelation, I always, I'm always trying to figure out how did the preacher get to that point? How did they get to understand it that way? And I'm trying to take you through so that you can understand it in a clear and concise manner. And that's why I'm breaking it down, not necessarily by vision, but by segment. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens in the throne room vision. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Verse 2 says, And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight of like an unto an, like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were, well, were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a glass of, was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within and they, and they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And they basically continued to worship God. And the essence of the worship was this. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. Now, if you were John, you might be asking yourself the question, what does this scene have to do with what's to come? Remember, the promise was given to John, come up here, and I will show you things to come. So what does this scene? This, in this scene, I'm not seeing anything about the future. All I'm seeing is a worship of God. And what I'm saying about this vision is that God's intention was to remind John that whatever happens after this, God is still in charge. This vision was to provide inspiration for God's people that when they, through, when they should go through the black horse and the pale horse and the red horse, they need to be reminded that all these activities are under the supervision of God. When they go through the dark ages, when they face persecution, they were to remind you that God is in charge. If you notice the worship that they give to God, they worship God as creator. And as creator, theologians will tell you that this is significant. It means that God owns all things. He alone deserves to be worshipped. He has sovereign right over all his creation. And he sustains all creation. And if you notice that the throne is, is speaking to that. The throne represents authority. It represents rulership. According to Psalm 103 and verse 19, the Bible says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. All And in Psalm chapter 11 and verse 4, the Bible also says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. So this vision of the throne is to remind us, to remind God's people that he rule it in the affairs of men. Because I'm telling you, from the time of John, to our time, the thing that the church were going to pass through 
needed that reminder that God is in charge. This was an important reminder, especially in the time of John, when Caesar or the Caesars presented themselves as ultimate rulers and demanded worship. God wanted to remind John and his people that he alone who sits in heaven deserves worship. In the dark ages when the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God and claiming all authority, God's people needed to be reminded that he alone deserves to be worshipped. And, and in modern time, the Christian church, God's people who faces secularism and, and atheism needed to be reminded that ultimately God is sovereign ruler over all. There are several persons in the Bible who received similar or receive throne room vision of God. One of them is Moses. When Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments and the establishment of Israel as a nation, he got a vision and a glimpse of the glory of God. Isaiah, before his call to ministry, saw the throne of God and saw the angels, the seraphims, worshiping God and crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And that's how Isaiah says, when a the, when the question was asked, who will we send and who will go for us? Isaiah was willing to go despite the hardness of the hearts of God's people, Isaiah was willing to go because he had seen the glory of God. As he said, in the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. So that gave him motivation and inspiration to go despite the challenging nature of the work. Ezekiel also, the prophet, who ministered to the people in Babylon, different from Daniel, Ezekiel, was one who was by the river Edekel and he was, he was to encourage the people of God. Ezekiel also received a vision of God through. Matter of fact, there are several languages that are borrowed from the book of, from Ezekiel's vision that you will see in the book of Revelation. For example, the, the four living creatures, they had six wings, the glory of God on the throne with a rainbow covering him and so on. These are very similar to that of Ezekiel. And this was to inspire Ezekiel to know, again, like Isaiah, despite the hardness of the hearts of the people, you can do your work. Zechariah the prophet also received a vision of God's throne because Zechariah was one of the prophets who encouraged God's people after the captivity to go forward in spite of the challenges that they face. They needed that reassurance that God is in charge. One of my favorite vision of the throne room of God is that of Stephen. Stephen was being unfairly persecuted and became the first martyr of Christianity, of the Christian church. When he was being stoned, the Bible says he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of power, assuring him that in spite of what he faced, God is still in charge. Micah the prophet also received a vision of God's throne. Micah was called to give a message to wicked King Ahab. And Micah needed courage and to know that what he says is of God. And he was able to courageously tell Mike, tell King Ahab the truth. Now that we understand a little better about the meaning of the vision, let's look at the interpretation of some of the symbols. The first one is the throne of God. On that throne, John said he saw someone like a jasper stone, a precious stone. He saw also a rainbow about his head and flashes of lightning and thunder before the throne and he saw a sea of glass before the throne. This vision is almost equivalent to that which is found in Ezekiel's chapters 1 to 2, the vision that Ezekiel saw of the throne of God. The 24 elders who sit on throne in the presence of God, theologians normally interpret these to be saints who have been resurrected and represented more like the first fruits of those who will eventually follow in the first resurrection. Where would these people come from? Well, we know of a few resurrections in the Bible. We know in terms of not only resurrections, but ascensions. We know of Enoch, we know of Moses, we know of Elijah, and we also know of the folks who were resurrected with Christ at his resurrection. So, because based upon the description of these persons, these elders, first they sit on throne in the presence of God, which is a promise that God, Jesus, gave to those who overcome. Secondly, they are clothed in white robes. 
the, this is something that God gives his saints for their faithfulness, according to Revelation chapter 3, verse and verse 5. The, the white robe represents righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And they are crowned with gold, which represents the crown of victory that is promised to all who overcome. The seven lamps of fire, the seven torches burning before the throne, represents the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because John actually brought greetings to the people. In the, in the first part of the book, the introductory part, chapter 1, John brought greeting from him who sit on the throne, from the Lamb, and from the seven spirits of God before the throne. So the seven lambs of fire represent the, seven, the Holy Spirit. The four living creature, which had six wings and features like a human, a calf, eagle, and, and a lion, or had the face of a human, lion, calf, and eagle, these, based upon Ezekiel's vision and based upon Isaiah's vision, these are seraphims who dwell in the presence of God. These are specially called angels who dwell in God's presence, who worship him day and night. And they, they cry holy, holy, holy continually because they are beholding God's glory every day. And because the Bible says in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore, they are seeing his glory every day. We are, we, we, when we get a little, a little glimpse of God's glory, we can do nothing but worship him. And so these creatures continually worship God and they continually listen to his instructions and his directives. So this vision of God's throne room was a, was a delightful opening to John's vision of what is to come. As I said before, it reminds John and God's people who will read these words in times of crisis that God is truly in charge. You're going to find that from here on, all the activities in the book of Revelation are coming from before the throne of God because he is in charge despite what happens God is ultimately in charge of all the affairs of men.